Next, we'll discuss bacterial endocarditis. Bacterial endocarditis is an infection of the endocardial lining of the heart and usually involves the heart valves. The most common symptom of bacterial endocarditis is fever. These patients may also develop Roth spots, which are findings on the retina, which are round white spots surrounded by hemorrhage. Roth spots generally are thought to indicate some type of embolic bacterial phenomenon from the heart. They may also develop Osler's nodes, which are non-infected autoimmune tender raised lesions on the finger or toe pads. Maybe a new heart murmur, which involves some type of eating away of the valve by the bacteria, as well as Janeway lesions, which are small erythematous lesions on the palm or the sole thought to be microabscesses. These patients also may develop anemia or splinter hemorrhages on the nail bed. Again, the valvular damage may cause new murmurs, such as regurgitant flow across the aortic valve, and multiple blood cultures are usually necessary for the diagnosis. These patients often have blood cultures that will not clear after a standard course of antibiotics. Patients that have bacterial endocarditis usually have one of two different clinical situations going on. The first is acute bacterial endocarditis. The most common bacterium to cause this is Staphylococcus aureus. Staph aureus causes large vegetations on valves that may have been previously normal. These patients will present rapidly and will often have severe damage to the valve. Oftentimes, these patients need to have their valves replaced. In contrast, the other type of bacterial endocarditis commonly seen is subacute. It's usually caused by virid and strep, which are low virulence organisms usually caused by some type of floral contamination of the bloodstream. These cause smaller vegetations on congenitally abnormal or diseased valves. Subacute bacterial endocarditis, or SBE, is often a sequelum of a dental procedure. This has usually a more insidious onset. These patients may complain of nonspecific type symptoms. Endocarditis may also be non-bacterial, secondary to some type of malignancy or a hypercoagulable state, which is commonly seen in morantic or thrombotic endocarditis. In morantic endocarditis, a person may have findings on echocardiography consistent with vegetations and may be having embolic phenomenon, but their blood cultures will be negative. Streptococcus bovis, which is a common intestinal floral bug, is commonly present in patients with metastatic colon cancer and may cause endocarditis. Staphylococcus epidermidis may be present on prosthetic valves at the time of surgery and may spread to the bloodstream. The Haysec organisms, including Haemophilus, Eichenella, and Kingella organisms, may cause culture-negative endocarditis. Special cultures may be required to isolate those organisms, especially in children, which they are commonly seen in. With bacterial endocarditis, the mitral valve is most frequently involved, followed by the aortic valve. Patients with tricuspid valve endocarditis generally are IV drug users, and the bugs most commonly seen are Staph aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Candida albicans. The complications of valvular endocarditis include chordae rupture with acute valvular regurgitation, as well as glomerulonephritis, from multiple embolic phenomena to the glomerular capillaries, as well as suppurative pericarditis with extension of the infection into the pericardial space, as well as other types of embolic phenomena. These patients may also develop valve ring abscesses that may cause interruption of the electrical signaling through the heart, especially the atrioventricular node. One mnemonic that you can use to remember the different signs and symptoms of bacterial endocarditis is from Jane. Fever, Roth spots, Osler's nodes, murmur, Janeway lesions, anemia, nail bed hemorrhage, and emboli. These pictures show splinter hemorrhage, which are commonly seen in patients with bacterial endocarditis, 
and a gross pathology section here of acute bacterial endocarditis that shows the vegetations on the valve ring. Another type of endocarditis is called Libman Sachs endocarditis. Libman Sachs endocarditis is commonly described as verrucous or wart like sterile vegetations that can occur on both sides, both upstream and downstream, on the valve. Normally, infectious endocarditis just involves the upstream face of the valve, the valve that the blood hits first, whereas Libman Sachs can affect both sides. Generally, Libman Sachs endocarditis is benign and it can be associated with mitral regurgitation and less commonly mitral stenosis. This is the most common heart manifestation of SLE. You can remember, systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE, causes Libman Sachs endocarditis. Next, we'll discuss rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic heart disease used to be very common in the United States, but now that we're treating our strep infections better, this has become relatively rare. Rheumatic heart disease is a consequence of pharyngeal infection with group A beta hemolytic strep or strep pyogenes. Acute rheumatic heart disease can cause a pancarditis, including an endocarditis, myocarditis, and a pericarditis. Most deaths early in rheumatic heart disease occur because of myocarditis and heart failure. The late sequela, meaning years from the initial heart disease, include rheumatic heart disease, which affects the heart valves, that is mitral most common, followed by aortic, followed distantly by tricuspid. The high pressure valves are affected the most. The earliest lesions that you can see with rheumatic heart disease are mitral valve prolapse usually, the latest lesion that you see is mitral stenosis. Remember that rheumatic heart disease is associated with Ashoff bodies in the myocardium, and these are granulomas that have inside of them giant cells and Anichkow cells, which are activated histiocytes. These patients can be diagnosed by having elevated anti-streptolysin O titers, meaning they're generating antibodies to this protein that's made by the bacterium. Remember that rheumatic heart disease is an immune-mediated or a type 2 hypersensitivity response and is not due to a direct effect of the bacteria on the heart. Besides making antibodies against streptolysin O, we also develop antibodies to the M protein of the bacteria, which is thought to cause the rheumatic heart disease. The mnemonic to remember for rheumatic heart disease is fevers, that is fever, erythema marginatum, valvular damage, elevated ESR, red-hot joints, subcutaneous nodules, and St. Vitus' dance, which is also known as chorea. This light micrograph shows an Ashoff body, which is one of the hallmarks of rheumatic heart disease. This granuloma within the myocardium contains large giant cells, as well as Anichkow cells, which are activated histiocytes. Next, we'll discuss cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is caused by compression of the heart by fluid, and that fluid is located in the pericardial space. That fluid can be composed of blood or some other type of effusion, and as the heart is compressed by that pericardial fluid, it can lead to decreased cardiac output. These patients often present with hypotension, elevated neck veins, and shortness of breath. In cardiac tamponade, you may see equilibration of diastolic pressures in all four chambers. The findings in cardiac tamponade generally include hypotension, elevated venous pressure, distant heart sounds, tachycardia, and what's known as pulsus paradoxus. Pulsus paradoxus, also known as Kussmaul's pulse, is basically an exaggerated decrease in the amplitude of the distal pulse during inspiration. All of us have a decrease in blood pressure when we take a breath in, but in patients with severe cardiac tamponade, asthma, obstructive sleep apnea, pericarditis, and even croup, there may be an exaggeration of that natural response. And this is due to increased right-sided pressures leading to a decreased cardiac output. 
Syphilis may also affect the heart, and tertiary syphilis is known to disrupt the vasa vasorum of the aorta. Since the aorta is such a large blood vessel, it relies on the vasa vasorum, or the smaller blood vessels around it, to feed the media and the adventitia. If these vasa vasora are disrupted, it can cause consequent dilatation of the aorta and the aortic valve ring. This can result in aneurysm of the ascending aorta and the aortic arch, as well as aortic valve incompetence or insufficiency and regurgitation. Patients with syphilitic aortic regurgitation and aortic root dilatation may also have calcification of the aortic root and the ascending aortic arch. This may lead to a quote-unquote tree bark appearance of the aorta.